as we open to Genesis chapter 50, it's a little bit of a sad day. I'm a little bit sad today because Genesis 50, this is the last chapter of this great book of the Bible. This is our last Sunday in the book of Genesis together. We've spent the majority of 2017 going through this great book of the Bible together. and Today's the last day. So I'm a little bit sad. All of you are glad because you're ready to move on to something else. But nevertheless, uh, this is our last day uh, today in Genesis. And the chapter, Genesis 50, it begins on a sad day as well. And this is the day that Jacob dies. This is the day that he dies and his children go to bury him. This is the the story of of Joseph and his brothers going to bury their father. And as we see in the beginning verses, when, when Jacob passed away, Joseph, one of his younger sons, he fell on his face. He fell on Jacob, Israel, as God had renamed him. And he began to cry. He began to weep. Joseph and and Jacob, they had a special bond. Joseph loved his dad, and he was sorry to see him go, even though his dad was 147 years old. You know, I would have have been happy to have 147 years with my dad, you know? But it just shows, it goes to show us that there's never a good time to lose someone you love. It doesn't matter if you've had 10 years with them or 147 years. When, When it's, death is always a sad thing. And so Joseph begins to weep. Um, In fact, it tells us that uh, the whole land of Egypt had a a national recognition of Joseph's death, uh, Jacob's death rather, and that the whole nation mourned for Jacob for 70 days, this period, this season of national mourning. And after that period was done, Jacob uh, asked, remember, he asked not to be buried in Egypt but to be buried back in the promised land. He made that request in faith because he believed that one day God would give that land to his offspring, to his descendants. And so Jacob had said, bury me in the cave where my grandfather uh, Abraham and my grandmother Sarah were buried. Bury me in that cave where my dad Isaac and my mother Rebecca were buried. Bury me in that cave where I buried my wife Leah. And so they take uh, Jacob back to bury him in that place. Coincidentally, um, that place today is in the land of Israel, Israel, the nation of Israel, in a city called Hebron. And for those of you who are going with me to Israel in April of next year, we're going to go visit this cave. We're going to go visit this place where Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are buried. We're going to go pay our respects to the fathers, the forefathers of uh, our faith. So we're looking forward to that, and that's going to be a great trip for those of us who are going. Anyway, so they they take Jacob to bury him back in this land, and it says that when they went, that Pharaoh sent with Joseph all of the servants of Pharaoh, in verse 7 it says, all of Pharaoh's servants, all of the elders of Pharaoh's household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. Basically, anybody who was, or everybody who was anybody, went to Jacob's funeral. He had this royal burial. In verse 9, it tells us it was a very great company, this huge procession of people that marched out of Egypt to go to this place. And it says for seven days they were there and had a season of mourning and weeping. Um, that's a long funeral. Some of you have been to some funerals I have where there were two hours and three hours long, and you're like, man, this is a long funeral. They had a seven-day funeral. After they had been mourning him for 70 days, they, they really uh, went all out with the, their funerals back then. And so after this, after they come back home, verse 14 says, after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Now, this is what I want to spend some time on here today is what happened after they buried Jacob. Verse 15 says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, 
they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did against him. How many of you remember the evil things that uh, his brothers had done to him, right? Tried to kill him, sold him, in, threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery, right? Some, they, did, they had done some naughty things uh, to their brother, uh, Joseph. And so after they bury Jacob, they're going back and they're thinking, oh my goodness, now that dad is gone, Joseph's really going to let us have it. He's been playing nice for the last 17 years. It's been about 17 years now that they've been in Egypt. He, he's been playing nice, but, but now that dad is gone, he, he's, he's going to come after us. And so they come up with this story. And they send a letter, they write a letter to Joseph, and they send a message to Joseph saying, your father gave us this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. So, <laughs> I don't believe that Jacob ever really told them that, because there's no record of it in the Bible. And if Jacob wanted to tell Joseph that, he could have just told him himself in person many times before. But they come up with this scheme of, you know, dad said that you had to forgive us, so please forgive us and don't hurt us now that he's gone. And sometimes what we see in dysfunctional families is that um, there's usually one very prominent figure holding everything together. It's either the grandma who loves the Lord and she's the spiritual head of the home or the dad who loves the Lord as the spiritual head. And, but it's a dysfunctional family and everyone gets together on Christmas and plays nice and we all love each other and Easter's a good time and Thanksgiving. But then when that person passes away, all of a sudden the truth comes out. All of a sudden everyone who was playing nice when grandma was here or when dad was here, their true colors begin to surface. And all of a sudden, things that were done 30 years ago are right back in the forefront. And there's all this animosity and anger that has been hidden and veiled. How many of you have ever experienced anything like this? Amen. It, it, once the, the, the head of the household is gone, things start to fall apart and they are worried that Joseph has been nursing this wound, this emotional scar against his brothers and what they did for some 40 years. They've been living in fear for 40 years. 17 years in Egypt, they've been living, waiting for the other shoe to drop. And so here now, Joseph receives this message and finally finally they ask Joseph to forgive them they've never yet asked Joseph to forgive them until this moment until they are afraid for their lives now they ask for forgiveness so the question is how is Joseph going to respond is Joseph gonna pay them back for what they did to them? What's going to happen? It tells us that Joseph wept when they spoke to him this way. That when Joseph saw that they were, they were still holding on to the past, it broke his heart. Joseph came to him, or Joseph 18, verse 18, Joseph's brothers also came and fell before him and said, we are your servants. Once again, we see, just as Joseph had dreamed some 40 years ago of his brothers bowing down to him, it's continuing to happen. They come and they bow before him. And when Joseph hears about this and when Joseph sees this, it breaks his heart. You see, Joseph, as we saw a long time ago, Joseph has moved on. Joseph's not holding on to this. We saw that Joseph was walking in forgiveness way back there, way before his brothers ever showed up asking for food, Joseph had forgiven them. Joseph had forgiven them who knows when, but it was, it was 
maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago possibly. And here Joseph sees that, that they still are holding on to these hurts from the past. Even though Joseph has moved on, even though Joseph is not living the past, his brothers have not moved on. His brothers are still reliving and living in that moment when they sinned against him. Joseph forgave them way before they ever asked for forgiveness. Hello? You, you got to learn to forgive people way before they even ask you to forgive them. Because who knows of whether they're ever going to get around to it. See, Joseph was, it was so far in the rearview mirror, he's not even thinking about this anymore. But even though Joseph has moved on, even though Joseph has forgiven them a long time ago, they have not forgiven themselves. Joseph is walking in forgiveness. They're walking in unforgiveness, not towards Joseph, but towards themselves. They have not been able to bring themselves to forgive themselves for what they had done to Joseph. Now, has Joseph been holding this over their head? No. no. What has he done for them? Provided for them, saved them, given them food, land, shelter, place to raise their family? Has Joseph given them any reason to think that he's holding unforgiveness in his heart? No. And when Joseph sees this, it, it breaks his heart to see that they are still living in the past. You see, unforgiveness, I'm going to say, I said this a couple weeks ago, but it, I need, it needs to be said again. Unforgiveness keeps you chained to the past. It keeps you in prison to your past. If, if you walk in unforgiveness against others or against yourself, you will stay chained to the past, chained to those hurts. It's not only that you have to forgive others, you have to learn to forgive yourself. I've heard people say so many times, I'll never forgive myself. I'll never forgive myself. And the question you need to ask is why not? Why won't you forgive yourself? Why can't you forgive yourself? Has God forgiven you? If God has forgiven you, but you still refuse to forgive yourself, are you saying that you're a better judge than God is? That, that you see the situation more clearly than God does? Oh, if God has forgiven you, you can forgive yourself. You have to walk in forgiveness with others and yourself. If God has forgiven you, who are you? Who do you think you are to not forgive yourself? And this is why Joseph weeps. What more does he have to do to show his brothers that he has forgiven them? What more can he do? See, this isn't an issue between Joseph and his brothers. This is an issue between his brothers and God. This is something that they have internally. And Joseph is like, what can I do to help you guys? And so what can Joseph do? What can he do to help them forgive themselves? He points them to God. He points them to God. In verse 19, Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? You see, when we choose to not forgive ourselves or others, we put ourselves in God's place. <laughs> That's God's place. God is the judge, amen? You are not the judge. He is. And when I choose to harbor unforgiveness towards others or myself, I put myself on the throne. I put myself on that seat of judgment that I was never meant to occupy. I put myself in the place of God. Jacob says, I'm not in the place of God, guys. I've forgiven you. You need to learn to forgive yourselves and move on. You see, Satan, our enemy, we have an enemy. Hello, folks. He's actively working against us. And what he wants to do is keep you chained to your past and keep you from the future that God has for you in Christ. And one of the great ways that he can do it is through unforgiveness. And so as he, as he 
condemns you because of the things you've done in the past? Does he remind you of the things that have been done against you? It's his way of keeping you from everything good that God has for you. And I don't want that for you. I want you to have everything that God has for you. Because it's good and it's glorious and it's better than anything that you can imagine. But the pathway there is forgiveness. First, receiving forgiveness from God, then learning to forgive myself and others. Forgiveness is the pathway to walking out the destiny that God has for you. And Satan loves to come. He loves to come and remind us of our failures and our faults. He loves to put lim- to try to put limits on us for our future by what we did in our past. He tried to do it with the Apostle Paul, reminding him of the things that he had done before he was a Christian. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, flip over there. We're coming back to Genesis 50, but Romans 8. Paul says this, Romans 8. Verse 1, he says, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. What does this mean? What does it mean that there is now no condemnation? It means when Satan comes to accuse me of my past, I point at the cross. When Satan comes to accuse me, to to remind me of the sins of my past, for the things that I've done against others, I point to the cross. I point to Jesus Christ. I I point to those sacred words. It is finished. And I say, I am now in Christ. And there is no condemnation. And he is in me. So take it up with him. Because God has forgiven me. God has set me free. Jesus came. To set me free from my past. Amen. So I'm not going to let Satan condemn me. I'm not going to relive the past. I'm not going to walk in the, the carrying the burden of my sin because Jesus carried it for me. All of us have sinned. All of us could live under condemnation. But for those of us who are in Christ... There is now no condemnation because our sins have been removed from us. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west. That's a, that's a long ways apart. It says that he, he has forgotten our sins. He's cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. That God doesn't even remember our sins. How can that be? I don't know, but I'm really glad that it is. So Satan comes. Satan's reminding you of stuff God's already forgotten. Because Jesus paid the price for it. Hallelujah. Because Jesus' blood has covered my sins. I've been washed clean. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I'm not going to hang my head in shame. I'm not going to live my life defeated because of the defeats of my past. Because Jesus is victorious. Amen. Jesus rose in victory. Amen. When Jesus walked out of that grave, he didn't walk out in defeat. He walked out in victory. And I am in Christ today through my faith in Jesus. So I don't have to be beat, live a life of, of defeat, of dejected, d- being dejected. I live a life of remorse. I live a life of victory today. Not in my own strength, but in him, in the strength and in the power of God. Verse 20, Joseph says to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me but God meant it for good Amen. to bring about to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today so do not fear I will provide for you and your little ones 
Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Walking with Jesus reshapes the way we see our lives. Having a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, it reshapes the way we see our lives, the events of our lives. It reshapes the way we see our world. Serving a God who is in control, amen? Serving a God who is all-powerful, all authority, who is sovereign, who is seated on a throne, who every knee will one day bow down to, Serving this God reshapes the events of my life. Yes, yes. The sin that's been done against me, the hurts that I have experienced, the lies that have been told to me and about me, every challenge, every trial, every temptation that I will face in this life, I view through a different lens. Because I serve an almighty God. Because I serve a God who can take what men meant for evil and who can work it for my good. Flip back over to Romans chapter 8 if you got it. Romans 8 chapter, uh, chapter 8 verse 28. He says, and we know, say we know, know. say I know, know. that for those who love God, anybody here love God today? Amen. Who's this talking about? It's talking about you. And I know that for those who love God, some things, or what does it say? All things. All things. Work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. How many things? All things. What does that include? Is there anything that is not included in all things? Everything in your life, God will work it for your good. Everything, 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 everything. When you slam your thumb with the hammer, God's going to work it for your good. When you electrocute yourself putting up Christmas lights in the rain, God's going to work it for your good. From the small to the big. God's going to work it for your good. All things. All means all. All things. For your bad? No. For your good. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. On the day we remember Christ's death, Good Friday... On that first Friday, as Jesus hung on the cross, Satan thought he had won. They were throwing a party in hell. We're finally going to get some AC down here. You know, they thought that they had won. The, the Son of God, crucified, that darkness had won, that darkness had defeated light. But we serve a God who takes what the enemy means for evil and he works it for our good. And even though Satan thought he had won, on that third day, God raised his son from the dead and crushed the head of Satan. We serve a defeated foe today. Defeated. We are victorious today in Christ. A God who can take the most evil thing and work it.
for good. What a powerful God that we serve. You see, we serve a God of redemption, the redeeming God. That's been the story of Genesis from the beginning. Over and over again, it's been this story. What we meant for evil through sin, God is somehow taking it and transforming it and working it for our good. Over and over and over again, evil being taken and God working it for our good. Because we serve an all-powerful, almighty, sovereign king. He goes on to say, the Apostle Paul, he says, those whom he foreknew, verse 29 of chapter 8 of Romans, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that they might be the firstborn of many brethren. Don't get hung up on this word predestined. So many people have a hard time with this word. You know what it means? It means God's in control. It means God is all powerful. It means God is ruling and reigning. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing that God is in control. Because let me tell you what, if God is not in control, he can't work evil for your good. But because we serve a God who is in control, who is all powerful, who is almighty, he can take what was meant for evil and work it for your good. He can work all things for your good. And this is a good thing that God is in control. And it's a good thing to surrender your life to a loving God. It is a good thing. It goes on to say that, that those are, be, have been, uh, are, it was for, he predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. God is conforming you. He's shaping you. He's molding you. He's making you more like Jesus. So submit to the process. Don't, don't fight against God trying to birth his son in you. That's what he's working on in you, bringing things to the surface so that you can let the flesh die and let the Spirit of God reign in your life. It goes on to say, those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. That's salvation. How many of you thankful for salvation? And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's future. That's where we're going to share that glory with the Son. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he also not give us all Listen, if God has given us his son, how can he not give us everything else? If, if he hasn't spared from us the, the most precious, the most important, the most valuable thing, why would he spare anything else from us that is good and gracious and wonderful? What can we say other than if God is for us, who can be against us? This, this reshapes the events of my life. When I see that God is in control, that God is on the throne, that even when harm and, and hurt come to me, calamity comes my way, it's not because God fell asleep or he took a nap or he was catching up on his DVR. It, it mean, doesn't mean any of that. It means that God is going to work this for my good. Just as Joseph experienced his pit and his selling into slavery and his false accusations, a decade in prison, God was working it for his good. And so tell me about your worst day. Tell me about the day that the worst thing happened to you, that, that day that in your mind defines your life by the evil in your life. Let me tell you, God's going to work it for your good. 
God's going to take it. He's going to transform it. He's going to redeem it. He's going to resurrect it because that's the God that we serve. That's the God that we serve. We see that Joseph's worst day is actually the first day of the plan of God being fulfilled in Joseph's life. Walking with Jesus reshapes. It's the lens through which we view our world. Your worst day is very possibly that first day of the plan of God. That redemptive plan, that resurrection plan being fulfilled and accomplished in your life. Joseph tells his brothers, look, it was hard. It was difficult. It stunk in the pit. It stunk being a slave. It stunk being a prisoner. But I'm glad it happened. Because God has used it to save all of us. So you guys don't need to keep living in bondage you don't need to you forgive yourselves guys because God has worked this for our good I don't know what you've been through we've all been through stuff but I do know that God will work it for your good and and at the end you will say I'm glad that I went through it because if I hadn't gone through it God wouldn't have been able to do this and look at what God has done Look at what God has done. He tells his brothers, get your eyes off of yourself. Put them on what God has done. Put them on God. Look at what God has done. So if you are there and you're still in the middle of the trial, hold on to this verse. Say it. Profess it. I know that I serve the God who works all things for my good. The closing verses of Genesis tell us about the last day of Joseph's life. In verse 22, it tells us that Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years. The next verse tells us that he saw uh, his children's children to the third generation. And at the end of his life, verse 24, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. But God. Say, but God. But God. Say, I'm coming to the end of my road, but God. But God God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and shall carry up my bones, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Joseph himself dies in faith, holding on to the promise of God. One day God is going to come through. One day God is going to deliver. One day God is going to make good on his word. And Joseph says, on that day, you don't leave me here in Egypt. On that day, you take me with you. And you bury me in that promised land. That's where I want to be. And Joseph made them promise And Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now, when you think about everything we've seen in Genesis, when you think about where Genesis began in a garden with God, Every need met, every want provided for, perfect relationship with God, communion, closeness, fellowship, perfect relationship between husband and wife. This is where Genesis began, in a garden with God. Yet because of sin, Genesis ends in a coffin in Egypt. God's people have gone from that close relationship with him in the garden to being buried because of death in Egypt. Now, thankfully, Genesis is not the end of this story. As you flip the page in your Bible, there's another book called Exodus. And this book begins with God getting ready to work a great story, a miraculous story of salvation 
and redemption for his people. And for us as believers, the, the message is when it seems like all hope is lost, when it seems like the dreams have died, when it seems like what God promised years ago will never come to pass, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord because our redemption is coming. God is the redeeming God. Redemption is on the horizon. And God the Redeemer is working through this fallen world and this fallen creation to bring restoration, to bring salvation to his good world. And God does not change. God does not change. God worked redemption for Abraham. He's going to work it for you. God worked redemption for Isaac. He's going to work it for you. God worked redemption for Jacob and for Joseph and for the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul and the brother of Jesus, James. God's worked redemption for his people from the beginning. And God's going to do it for you as well. Do you believe it? Yeah. Do you know it? Yeah. Do you trust it? Yeah. This is the God that we serve. The redeeming God. The sovereign God, the God who is in control of the events of our lives, the good God, the good God who can take what the enemy meant for evil and who will work it for your good. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you that you are the good God who works all things for our good. Lord, help us to not let this just be words in a book, but let it be the faith we embrace. Let it be a, a, the walk that we possess with you. Lord, that when the tests and the trials and the temptation and the hurts and the pains and the sin come, that we can face it like Joseph in faith, knowing that your nature and your character does not change and that you will redeem it, that you will work it, that you will transform it, and that you will bring resurrection life. Lord, for those in the midst of the test, Lord, that their faith would remain strong. That their grip on your promises would not loosen, but it would tighten. That you would give them the strength to persevere in faith. Knowing, Lord, that you are bringing that glory. That that is what is on the horizon. Lord, we look to you. Help us to get our eyes off of ourselves, of our own shortcomings, our own inadequacies. Silence the voice of the accuser, the voice of the condemner. Let us walk forward with you in faith each and every day. Help us to live a life of worship unto you until you return. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen.